Amen. Yeah, thank you, Gawain Ruth, leading us uh, in worship and uh, in that, that hymn there as well. Let's just uh, bow our heads and pray. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, Father, as we've just been singing those words, I love thee. I love thee, Jesus. Today, in this day, we love you. When we think of all the blessings we can receive now, all the blessings that we can receive in the future to come, to be with you forever, we want to say we love you. We love you. And I just pray now, Father, as we share your word, as we come around your word, that your spirit just rest upon us. As we choose to love you, we know as we love you and as we follow you, you give us your spirit, you give your very presence to come and live and dwell in us, to speak to us. And I pray you'd speak to each and every one of us today. And I pray you'd help me as well as I communicate and share what you've laid on my heart. I ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let me just uh, find my notes here somewhere. So there we go. Well, we're on the uh, next our series um, in Building Church, and so this is number 14 uh, in our series. So those of you who've been with us, we started at the end of last year, so we've been going for quite some time. Uh, but actually, last time I spoke uh, with you, I actually kind of focused on a, a side note, you could say, but I talked about the spiritual battle that we face in our daily lives. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the Apostle Paul says this, he says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But uh, I'm sure you've all experienced, if you've been a Christian for a few years or maybe a few months, however long you've been a Christian, um, we know that our flesh, our selfish worldly ways and desires are continually in conflict with the Holy Spirit who lives and dwells in us. And so rather than living by the Spirit and being led by the Spirit to become more and more like Jesus Christ, which is what we're called to, to become, we can actually gratify the desires of our flesh and feed the compulsions of selfishness to act like this world, to live uh, for ourselves, to live in a way independently from God. And those of you with us a couple of weeks ago, um, I was sharing with you that that was a downfall of the people in the church of Corinth. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he almost, you could almost say, challenges them or kind of confronts them of how they're living their lives. They're supposed to be followers of Jesus. And this is what he says to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? And so a question that I gave to you a couple of weeks ago, and I want to say it again today as I sort of carry on with what I want to share today. The question was this, what about you and me? If the Apostle Paul came to us as a local church, if he came to your house, how would he address you? How would he address me? Would he address you as a people who live and walk by the Spirit? Or would he address you as a people who are still worldly, still infants, immature, acting like mere men without the leading of the Holy Spirit? Well, as you heard last week, Roger uh, Davis was with us. He came from over from Souls Harbour and uh, he shared a message with us about who we are as God's people. We are God's workmanship. We are created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And that's in Ephesians 2 verse 10. And so we are saved for good works. I know I've said that to you perhaps a number of times at the front here uh, as a local church, that we are saved for good works. We're not saved by good works, but we're saved for good works to live and to walk by the Holy Spirit. And there's three reasons, you know, why we are called to do good works. We're called to do good works so that we can become more and more like Jesus Christ in our character and in our lifestyle. Secondly, that we would be his witnesses to share the good news of Jesus, to be a light in this darkness. And then thirdly, that we would do his works that he has predestined, that he has um, prepared for us to do in advance so that we would be a people who are no longer conforming to the pattern of this world, but that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, transformed by the, the presence of the Spirit in us and transformed as we live and obey his word. And then Paul goes on to say, and if we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, then we will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. And so as I carry on with my kind of message that I kind of start, started last time, is to ask that question to us again. How then do you live? How do you and I live? 
Do you still act like mere men in a worldly way, dead to sin, without the Holy Spirit? Or are you and am I living and walking by the Spirit as citizens of heaven, as men and women who are part of God's heavenly and eternal family, who are living in God's perfect will, fulfilling his purposes and doing his works on this earth that you and I are created in Christ Jesus to do. Well, as I was thinking about this, I was um, reading in uh, one of the Gospels um, in Luke about John the Baptist. And obviously John the Baptist came to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus Christ. And when he first came along, he wasn't kind of going into the main cities and towns to tell everyone about the coming of Jesus. He was out in a desert and people would go out to see him in the desert. And one of the things he said to the people, to the crowds that came to him was this. This is in Luke chapter 3, verse 8. He says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. That meant if you and I are serious in following God and his ways and to turn from sin and the ways of this world, then we would produce fruit. We would be radically different. We would live differently. We would act differently. And so John is really direct to all the crowds that come to him on what would happen to a false believer, to the one who did not produce fruit. Because there's lots of people coming out just to see what's happening, coming to see John. And so he was, hit, he was kind of hitting home hard that their lives, if you are serious about God, your life must produce fruit. And he went on to say this in Luke 3 verse 9. He said, the axe has been laid to the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, if you were an observer or listening when you were out there in the desert listening to John, those are pretty hard words. If you and I do not produce fruit, we'll be thrown into the fire. So how did the crowds respond when they heard John say this? Well, in Luke 3.10, they basically asked this question, what should we do? What should we do to produce fruit? They wanted to know. And listen to what John says. You can see this in Luke 3, verse 11 to 14. John answered them. He said this. First, he says, anyone who has two tunics should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. So he's basically challenging them. If you want to know what to do, be generous. Be generous and share with those who are in need. That is the ways of God. Not the ways of this world, but that is the ways of God. And then in verse 12, tax collectors who have come out to see him, they ask the same question. So you imagine you're a tax collector and you're like, what do I do as a tax collector? And then John says to them, don't collect any more than you are required to. He was basically challenging them to be honest and to not be greedy. If you're going to live God's way, then be honest and not greedy. And then thirdly, not only do you get uh, tax collectors come to him, but then you get soldiers that come to him and the soldiers have come out into the desert and they're asking, what should I do? And then John replies and says, don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. And so was, he was basically saying to, to not lie, to be soldiers of integrity and content with what they had. And so as these people came to John, he was giving them actions on what they could do to produce fruit and to live in God's ways. And so it could be summarized, these three actions he shared, it could be summarized as this. Number one, be generous. If we're going to live God's way, be generous. Secondly, be honest. And thirdly, be content with what you have. And those are ways that you could produce fruit. Well, during Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, so you had kind of John out in the desert, and then Jesus came onto the scene. He was then preaching to the crowds. And so they got the famous Sermon on the Mount. And he echoed words very similar to John. In Matthew 7, 18, he said this, A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And then he says this, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So similar words to what John said. So think a moment again about your life and my life. Are you a good tree or are you a bad tree? Does your life produce fruit in keeping with repentance? And just think about this. If you and I, if you are saved, if you are born again as a Christian, then Jesus Christ, who is good in every single way, 
now lives in you and in me. And so if he is in me and you, then the seed, the glory is, as Paul was sharing in communion, the glory that we can share, the glory of God now comes to live and dwell in us. He who is good, who is perfect, who is holy, who is set apart in every way can live in us. And when we listen and obey and follow his ways, according to his word, then you and I will produce fruit and will produce good fruit because the one who is good is in us. But the opposite is also true. If we ignore or disobey or forget his word or don't live according to his word, then you and I will not bear good fruit. And Jesus warned if we don't bear fruit, then we will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And only a couple of verses on in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus makes it even more clear when he said this. You imagine all the crowds there and he says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He's probably got your attention now. He says, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. That's a sobering thought that potentially some of us here may not enter the kingdom of heaven because our life does not produce fruit in keeping with repentance. If we are not doing the will of our Father in heaven, then we could be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, listen carefully to what I'm saying here. I know I've said this before in other sermons I've given. I'm not talking about salvation by works here. I'm talking about true salvation leads to works and good works. A good tree, Jesus says, will produce good fruit. Just as those who are truly in Christ and Christ is in them, they will bear good fruit. And Jesus helps us to understand this more when he shares his famous words about the branch and the the vine. Or the vine and the branches in John chapter 15. And this is what Jesus says. And these are very familiar words with us. And sometimes we can read them and just sort of skip through. But really think about what Jesus is saying here. He says, remain in me. And I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. And if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear fruit much fruit and apart from me Jesus says apart from me, you can do nothing if you do not remain in me he says you are a branch that is thrown away and withers and such branches are picked up thrown into the fire and burned and so there's that warning again Jesus says if you do not remain in me if you do not bear fruit then you will be picked up thrown in the fire and burned It's very clear from God's word that a bad tree or a fruitless branch will be cut down or picked up and thrown into the fire. So what Jesus is saying very bluntly to the people that came to him is this, a bad tree or a fruitless life will be thrown into hell. Hard hitting words. But Jesus wanted to get their attention and he wants to get our attention today. So what is your response? Is your response the same as the crowds that came out to John? So what should I do? How can I be a tree that bears good fruit? How can I be a branch that bears much fruit? In other words, how can I live a good life? How can I live a fruitful life that will be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven to be given the crown of glory and to be with him forever and ever? Well, let me just help to answer that question with three suggested steps of how you and I can live a good and fruitful life. Number one, A for admit. We need to admit firstly that we are a bad tree to start with. Each and every one of us, we need to humble ourselves and say that without God, without Jesus Christ, as we grow up in this world, we are a bad tree and even our good deeds, every good thing we do is like filthy rags to God. That's what we read in Isaiah 64, 6. Let me read it to you. It says this, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous acts, all of our good deeds, are like filthy rags. 
We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. And so without God, we are a bad tree, and we will not bear good fruit. So A, we need to admit that. And then the second thing is to be believe. We need to believe that Jesus Christ, he is the only one who is good, who is good in every way, and we need him. Every one of us needs him in our lives. Because with him in our lives, we can become a good tree. As we just shared in John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Because the good, the one who is good is in us and we are in him. And he says, and apart from me, you can do nothing, nothing that is good. And if you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers and such branches picked up, thrown in the fire and burned. And so without Jesus, we will be thrown away and burned. But with Jesus, with the one who is good, who is dwelling and living in us, then we will bear much fruit and not much fruit, but also produce good fruit. And that leads me on to my third step. So A, we need to admit that without him, we are a bad tree. We, uh, B, to believe that Jesus is the good tree and we need him who is good. And then thirdly is to commit, C, commit, to commit our lives on a daily basis to listen, to obey and to follow Jesus so that we can continue to produce good fruit and much fruit. Jesus goes on to explain that a little bit more in, in John 15, in verse 8. He says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And then in verse 10, he says, if you keep my commands, this is the part where we continue to grow as we learn. He says, if you keep my commands, if you follow my ways, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commands, I've obeyed my father and remain in his love. And in verse 16, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. And that's what this series, Building Church, has been all about over the last number of months. It's about you and I, as God's people, in God's church, becoming good trees who are in Christ and where Christ dwells in us, so that we would produce much good fruit as we commit our lives to listen to him, to obey him, to follow him, his ways, his word, and not the ways of this world. It's so easy day to day in this world we live, where we're hearing, how, or watching, observing, taking in everything that the world throws at us. And it's so easy to follow the patterns of this world. But God doesn't want us to conform to the patterns of this world. He wants to renew our minds. And that's why we've been going through this series, to help us to renew our minds, to be transformed, to be the people he wants us to be. Jesus said, if you keep my commands, if you follow me, if you remain in my love, in me, you will bear much fruit. But if you do not remain in me, he warns them, we are like a branch picked up, thrown in the fire and burned. And he doesn't want any of us to end up in that direction. And my heart is for, for me and you, for none of us to head in that direction but to know that we are saved and that we are called to do the good works that he has prepared in advance for us to do. And so in recent months, we've been going through Romans chapter 12 and verse 9 and 13, particularly in recent weeks, so that you and I can learn together and listen and obey God's commands and his words so that you and I can produce good fruit. And so we've been looking at 10. Uh, if you were going to say, like, okay, what do we do today? How do we then produce fruits that's in line with God's word that will help us to become more like Christ? Well, there's 10 things we've been looking at um, that we are to do as followers of Jesus. Number one is your love must be sincere. Your love must be genuine. Number two, you must hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Well, as I've said, who is good? Jesus, let's cling to him. Number three, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Number four, honor one another above yourselves. Number five, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord, the one who is good. We follow him. Number six, be joyful in hope. Number seven, be patient in affliction. Number eight, be faithful in prayer. And so those eight we've covered. And so what I'm looking to do now is look at the last uh, two of these 10. Number nine, share with God's people who are in need and 10, practice hospitality.
And so if you and I are saved, if you and I say, I love you, Jesus, then you and I should be pursuing these things in our lives. How can I live these out? Because I love you, Jesus. I want to live not to the patterns of this world, but I want to live to your ways. Then this is what we're to do. This is how we're to live, to become good trees in Christ who will produce good fruit and much fruit that will last. So we've looked at the last date. Uh, I want to look at the next two uh, commands. Uh, that's number nine, share with God's people in need, and then 10, practice hospitality. I think the clock stopped over there, so I'm going to keep looking at my watch. So I'm just going to look at those two things to finish uh, today. So one, each in turn. Number nine, share with God's people who are in need. If you want to know what to do to produce fruit, this is what we need to do. We need to be generous to each other. John the Baptist, he shared a very similar command when he was out in the desert about generosity, as I read to you earlier, Luke 3.11. He says, anyone who has two tunics should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. And when you look back at the early church, that was the culture, that was the way of life of those first followers of Jesus. In Acts 2.44-45, how did they live? It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions. Why? To give to anyone who had need. Their property and possessions they sold so they could give, so they could be generous. In Acts 4, 34 and 35, it says this, there were no needy person among them in the early church. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, they put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed. It was given to anyone who had need. I don't know about you, but when you read those verses, there's that amazing picture of the early church, of how generous that they were. They were so generous, they even sold what they had to have monies so that it could be actually given to those who were in need. So what about us today? What is the culture of this church? And when I say church, that means you and me. What is the culture of the way you and I live as part of New Life Church? Are we part of a Christian community that is generous? Generous as we see in, in God's word to one another. Well, in recent months, obviously I'm part of this church as well. I've been so encouraged to see people in this church share in so many different ways. There's people in this church who've shared food, shared money, shared clothes, shared tools, shared cars, shared transport. And obviously that's one that's received on the other end of that to get transport uh, and also time. And so I've seen people in this church go out of their way to give, to share and to help others in the church by being generous. And it's been amazing. So what about you? Have you been one of those? Are you generous? Are you thinking of others in the church family? Or are you self-focused and not even aware of the needs of others in the church family? Because if you and I are saved, if you and I are in Christ, then we are to become like Christ, who was generous in every way. And so if he was generous in any way and we want to be more like Christ, how are you and I becoming more and more generous? And even more so in the times we live where there's increasing living costs, food bills, financial strain, and I'm sure we're all feeling the pinch. Well, as I was reading about a kind of the, the challenge we face today, one commentator put this, something happens inside of human beings in times of crisis. Our instincts for self-preservation kick in, and we begin to cultivate a scarcity mindset, focusing on what we don't have. And it becomes very easy to focus on the well-being of ourselves and our family, and forget the difficulties of others around us. We are especially prone to this behavior in times of uncertainty, just like the times that we live today. So do you have a scarcity mindset? Are you focusing on what you don't have and clinging to your worldly goods? Or are you allowing time to get to know others, to know their needs and how you can help them? Well, this commentator went on to say this. He said, now we might not be rich. You know, me and Jen are not rich. And you might think, well, I'm not rich. You know, what do I have to give? But we all have been given gifts and abilities that we can share with others. And they come to when and say, like, our time, care, prayer, resources. There's so many things that we can offer. And also, God has been so generous to us in so many ways. So how can you and I be generous 
to those that God puts around us. So just take a minute or take a moment just, just now, maybe just bow your heads for a moment. Just think, what could you share? What has God put in your hands? It may not be financial m- monies, but what is it that God's given you? What gifts, abilities, time do you have that you can share? And just think, what could you share specifically to others and to whom in this church family? Because we're all called to be generous to each other. Man, yeah, if you just want to open your eyes again. And let me just read this before I go on to the last point. See, time just going. But in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8, a well-known passage about giving. This is what God's word says. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you, and includes me, should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And I believe that's just not in financial giving, but in what we give of our lives to others. And this is the promise. God loves you and I if we give and are generous, and God promises this, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. What an amazing promise that is from God. If you and I are generous in how we live our lives, if we are generous to those that God puts around us, he promises he is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So let me encourage you. Let's be a people. Let's be God's church today who is generous to one another, who shares and gives and helps in whatever way we can. Okay, then lastly, number 10. We're doing time. Yeah, I've got a few more minutes. Uh, number 10, and practice hospitality. What can we do if we're going to produce fruit? Practice hospitality. This is another great way that we can be generous to one another by opening our homes to each other. Well, hospitality can be defined as the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests or and visitors or even strangers. And so let me ask this question to you. How friendly, how generous, and how hospitable are you to others in the church family? And how friendly, generous, and hospitable are you to others that you know on your front line, in your family, your neighbours, your work colleagues, that you invite into your home? And when we look back at the early church, they were great at hospitality. Hospitality was another major value. It was another priority for the early church. It was part of their DNA. It was part of their culture. Acts 2, 46, 47 says they broke bread where? In their homes. And they ate together. That's why we're planning some things in the coming weeks. They ate together to be together and eat food together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Community, togetherness, fellowship, hospitality, It was high on their agenda. And what did God do? He blessed them. It says, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And also when we think about hospitality, it was also the value and the culture that was expected and taught by the apostles. So when the apostles were writing letters to all these new church plants all around uh, the known world back then, the uh, the apostle Paul, when he writes his letter to, to the church in Rome, what does he say as we've read? He says in Romans 12, 13, he says, practice hospitality. That's what you should do. If you want to know what to do as a local church, practice hospitality. And then we go to Peter, the apostle Peter's letter. And he writes to the scattered churches and he says this in 1 Peter 4, 9. He says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I don't know why he added that bit on the end. (laughs) Were they grumbling about it? But he says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling about it. And then in Paul's letter to Timothy and Titus, you've got these young pastors, leaders that have grown up in the church. He, Paul writes to them and says, um, or lists a number of characteristics and criteria. If you're going to appoint a new elder or a new leader of your church, then they must be temperate. They must be self-controlled. They must be respectable. They must be able to teach. They must not be quarrelsome. They must not be a lover of money. And he lists all these different things. And one in the list is this. He says they must be hospitable. If they're going to be an elder or a leader in a church, they must be hospitable but I believe that's not just for church leaders I believe that's for all of us as followers of Jesus and even in the letter written um, or called Hebrews we don't know the the author of Hebrews but the writer of Hebrews also 
emphasizes the importance of hospitality. In Hebrews 13, one to two, he says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters, as family. And he says in verse two, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, not just to those within the church family, but to strangers. Because he says, for, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So are you friendly, generous, and hospitable to others in the church family and to strangers? What about those vis visitors that may join us on a, on a Sunday? Maybe there's some people here in this church family you don't you really know. Have you opened your home to invite them around to get to know them a bit more? So as I finish now, my time is coming to a close. I just want to give four practical suggestions on what we can do to practice hospitality in the coming months, in July, August, September, and beyond. So number one, can you invite someone from the church family to your home one evening for a meal? Or maybe if you don't want to put on a meal, you know, just for some tea and cake. <laughs> but who will you invite round? Could it be one person from the church family? Could it be two? Could it be one of the families in the church? Could you do that this month, next month, maybe every other month? Who could you invite? Could be an evening in the week, could be a Saturday or Sunday, it suits you. But will we practice hospitality? Because that's what God teaches us to do. Number two, can you host a small group one week? One of our Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday groups. Could you host one? They're in different homes at the moment. Maybe you could open up your home to be a host. Or can you prioritize to attend a small group more regularly than you do? To get to know people, to get to know each other's needs and how you may be able to be generous in helping someone else. Can you offer to help bring snacks or food to that small group or help to serve the guests that come and tidy up after? Can you practice hospitality either as a host or in someone else's home to share with them? Number three, can you join the welcome team or the refreshments rota once a month or bi-monthly? Because if we're going to be a local church that practices hospitality, we need to do that when we gather together like this on a Sunday or other times. Because we want to be a church that values and prioritizes hospitality. Will you be friendly and generous to all those who join us? Will you help and serve and bring food or our joint... Um, shared lunch next time to come along and be a part of that, to, to be hospitable and generous to each other. Will we practice hospitality? And number four, we've also got some planned men's and women's uh, events coming up. So will you invite others? Will you host? Will you serve? Will you help and serve and practice hospitality in those gatherings? And so there's just some suggestions on front out. Maybe there's lots of others you can think of. But actually, if I'm going to be someone who produces fruit and follows Jesus, how can I practice hospitality? But how can we as a local church practice hospitality so as i close let me remind you if we're going to build a church that is healthy and fruitful that produces good fruit and much fruit let's choose for each of us to commit our lives to listen to obey and to follow jesus by pursuing his ways his word and not the ways of this world let's just bow our heads yeah father we thank you that you are so so generous to us when we think of the word grace, when we think of the word mercy, we know we don't deserve anything from you. But yet you give so much. And mostly, and most of all, you gave your son, Jesus Christ. You gave him. And he willingly gave his life for us so that we could know you, that we could be saved, that we could be washed clean and changed from being a bad tree that will be thrown into the heap and burnt to become a good tree that will produce good fruit. And so I pray that we'll take it seriously, that if I love you, if I want to follow you, it means continuing to follow you on a daily basis. It doesn't mean, oh, I've got my ticket to heaven and then we just sit back and wait till our days pass by, but it means growing. It means learning. It means listening. It means obeying your word so that we would walk in your ways. Not